Welcome everyone to another exciting ICPS monthly webinar. Today we're going to go behind the scenes for some of the MACPS, Mid-Atlantic Carnivorous Plant Society's members. We're going to see their wonderful collections. The ICPS has an official website. It's carnivorousplants.org. This May, we have an international conference. It is going to be at the Schönbrunn Palace in Vienna, Austria. And the dates are May 24th to May 26th. Those dates are for the three days of people giving presentations. The international conference will be the fourth international conference for ICPS. We usually do it every other year. And for 2024, it is hosted by the German speaking Carnivorous Plant Society. All of the presentations will be in English, except for one. Everyone's welcome. If you go to our website or if you go to their website, you will see that the registration, the program, the dates and times are all up. And I just mentioned that there's three days of presentations, but there are field trips after the three days of uh, presentations. We're gonna go to the Czech Republic for a day. And then we're going to go to some other outings and see some really cool plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society is a group of about 1,200 paid members. We are from all over the world. We like to host educational content like behind the scene tours. And uh, on our Facebook page, Instagram page, and on our YouTube page, we have five animated videos. They're all about uh, raising carnivorous plants. They're great for kids, great for adults. We encourage you to utilize them in your programming, share them with kids, share them with teachers. All of these uh, five animated videos also have uh, worksheets and like fill in the blank uh, worksheets, coloring sheets that you guys can implement wherever you are. The first Wednesday of May every year is World Carnivorous Plant Day. 2024 will be our fourth annual World Carnivorous Plant Day. On that day, we host, we post rather, over 24 videos about the cultivation and conservation of carnivorous plants. These videos are in many different languages. They're posted on our YouTube channel and then they're shared on our social media. If you are interested in creating content, for World Carnivorous Plant Day, you can send me a message at Kenny at carnivorousplants.org or education at carnivorousplants.org. And I don't know if I introduced myself, but I'm Kenny Coogan and I'm the education director and the public relations person for the ICPS. If you want to become a paid member, you can go to icps.clubexpress.com Here's our different membership tiers. You can also become an e-member. If you become a regular member, you get a beautiful quarterly full-colored newsletter. And I do have one with me right here. And uh, in it is the new cultivars that are being described, field trip reports, conservation reports, and then there's notes about our upcoming conferences. If you become a member, you also get access to our seed bank. And there's more details about that on our website, on the member's website, icps.clubexpress.com. Our seed bank is only as good as our members. So if you have extra surplus seeds, please consider donating them. And then all of the seeds benefit our education and our conservation initiatives. And one thing that I just started up uh, two or three years ago is Carnivores in the Classroom. And this is a grant that we provide for teachers all around the world. We give them $150 worth of carnivorous plants to add to their K through 12 public classroom. This year, we were able to fund 50 classrooms around the world. And the grant application is August 1st through August 31st every year. You can go to our main website, carnivorousplants.org, and you would do slash education to learn about the grant, or you could go to slash donate to donate towards the grant. 
we were able to sponsor up to 50 teachers this year because of all of these wonderful carnivorous plant nurseries. And what I'm more excited about is that this year, it is uh, November, we already have carnivorous plant nurseries from around the world contacting us saying that they want to be part of 2024's grant uh, uh, process so we can fund even more teachers, which makes me ecstatic. Um, I think we all remember the first time we learned about carnivorous plants, the first time we got hooked um, and fascinated by them. So that's what we want to do. We want to inspire the younger generation to appreciate plants, especially carnivorous plants. And I think this is a great way by adding them into the classroom. If you don't want to donate outright, you know, just give us money. We are a uh, tax uh, exempt society, so we can give you a little tax credit. But instead of just donating, you can buy some merchandise. We have tote bags, mugs, t-shirts. I'm wearing uh, my favorite plant, Nepenthes bicalcarata, the Nepenthes with the fangs. And uh, all of this is available through our store. The store ships worldwide. And we also at that store have uh, 2024 World Carnivorous Plant Day merchandise. So you can get this logo of a cephalotus eating the world. And it has next year's date, Wednesday, the 1st of May, 2024. And you can get this on a mug, a t-shirt, a tote bag, lots of cool stuff. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Wallace, and as the group is named Mid-Atlantic, where I'm just outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, I've been with the organization, uh, the Mid-Atlantic um, organization, I don't know, Kevin, what, two, three years maybe? Um, I've been on the board last year and uh, probably on the board again this year. I've been uh, doing plants, if you want to call doing plants, for quite a few years. As I've gotten older, I've kind of scaled down from a 5,000 square foot outdoor garden to kind of uh, carnivorous plants, which uh, through most of my experience as a young adult, I've spent a lot of time in the wetlands, primarily in uh, Florida area, but not exclusively in the Everglades specifically. And um, wetlands and carnivorous plants have always been kind of a, a, a thing of mine, or <laughs> a bad habit, as my wife would say. Uh, we're, we're in the mid-Atlantic. Mid it snowed for the first time uh, today. It's dark. It's uh, almost the beginning of December, so there's not much outside. I have quite a bit more outside than inside, and um, well, what I can do is show you what I have here. So let me turn around here, and here we go. And uh, this is primarily the carnivorous corner, and I have some one-year-old seedlings of uh, some Saracenias here. They're doing rather well. Uh, quite a few varieties, uh, red ruffles, uh, leucophila, um, quite a few different things over here. I have some humidity domes with some, you can see in there a little bit, there's some uh, binatas. I've started some terrariums that have done really kind of humidity rooms. I learned this from a tip from one of our members that some of these uh, Mexican pinguiculas like to have some humidity. So as soon as I put them in these little tanks with gravel, with some water, they've really gone to town. I have quite a variety of some here. Um, in fact, unfortunately, I fed them last night, um, so they look a little dirty. They've got some fish bits on them, some blood worms. Uh, Kevin, help me with this one. I always, again, the Latin, this is the red one, Alfred Lau, Lin, Linau, if I believe. Some uh, Hayupon back there. Um, some Emerginata, some Tina. I have quite a few Aphrodites, Cyclasta, 
quite a few things here. And of course, everybody needs to have some capensis, a few epiphytic uh, utricularia, which is kind of a new new thing for me. I'm really enjoying them. And some other things in tubes that I'm trying to, you could see, have some things coming off of flower stalks there. They're um, uh, bonatas that I took over the summer or late fall as things were going. And down below, I'm I'm curious for some thoughts here. I I got a um, a, a parrot pitcher um, miner there, and um, it did not like winter last year, although it was really well healed in. Um, it took quite a while to come out of dormancy. It did come back. It's got a couple of different um, nodes there, and I'm wondering. Uh, being zone seven, um, indoors in winter or not? So that's kind of the question. And then our three sisters here. Um, and I have some other, couple other things that are just kind of growing, growing amongst everything else here. One of my joys that I was sharing with our, our group in the last week is a terrarium that I started about three years ago with three plants, an Aphrodite, uh, the, the crimson red and an emergenata. And um, I, I had a utricularia at one point, I thought it all died off for better or for worse. I recycled the soil. Next thing I know, I have some, um, I don't know if it's calcif, Calcifia or um, oh, what's the other one? I can't remember now. Uh, it's it's literally climbing up out of the tank up to the shelf above, and it's going gangbusters. It's just going gangbusters, um, and all of them are going nuts in there. They're getting rather crowded, so it's pretty cool. I started a couple other minor rock terrariums. Um, kind of playing around with that. I had some ferns in the room that spored, and so now I actually have a maidenhair fern growing in with a growing in with some gracilis, uh, pinguicula gracilis. So, and then at the other end of the room, pardon as we run. I just I'm in limited room. This is kind of my uh, my pin corner for the winter. Uh, I have dozens and dozens um, Aphrod baby Aphrodites. It's they're almost breed the Aphrodites almost breed like rabbits. This is kind of typical a forage pot that is absolutely crowded to the max. I keep splitting them off and keep having more Aphrodites. Some gracilis coloring up rather nicely. And what I do, and I did a thing this summer with our group when we were at Carnivorous Plant Nursery. I did a kind of a ping thing. I take the uh, the takeout containers with uh, tissue. I write on the tissue what they are, a couple of drops of water, and lo and behold, uh, you know, give them four to six weeks and they start sprouting. You saw in one of the other back over there, the Hyupons. I divided one of them up because there were just too many. And the next thing I knew when I divided it up, I had, I don't know, 50 leaves. And now they're in here. And I think every one of them is starting to, uh, starting to sprout. So that's kind of what I'm doing, and you see some of the flowers, the holuponds the, that were actually split off. I think of the individual plants out of one pot, maybe 25 out of a out of a four inch or three inch pot. And then I had 
30 or 40 leaves that are, you know, seemingly all doing their thing. And this is kind of where I keep them. David, the light, uh, yeah. Ke Keegan says your pings look fantastic. And uh, <laughs> you, have, you have a couple of questions. What is your fertilizer or feeding uh, regimen? Because you mentioned you fed them last night and they, they looked like they were eating and feasting. Yes. So every we're into the their Mexican pings, we're into the winter. So they're some of them will go succulent. The the Aphrodite seem like they never, never stop, just never stop. Um most of the others seem to go succulent or semi-succulent. And so I may back off on the feeding. Uh when I feed them, um in season, I try to feed them every couple of weeks. And then again, in season, when it's summer, spring, fall, there's plenty of, you know, fruit flies and whatever around. And usually at that point, the uh, Aphrodites are absolutely like magnets. Um, in fact, we've used them in the kitchen when we get the tomatoes in and you always seem to have a plethora of uh, fruit flies when there's fruit around or particularly tomatoes in summer and the Aphrodite's just munch, munch, munch out of season. Um, every couple of weeks, if they look hungry or if it's been, been a while and I alternate between blood worms and the uh, fish bits, the uh, was a chiclet mm -hmm. fish bits. Yep. Cichlid. Uh, cichlid. Yeah. Just kind of, a little bit of a dusting of a powder on them once every couple of weeks um, for the penguiculas. I'm kind of proud of the penguiculas. I, I really enjoy them. They're really diverse. They're really relatively colorful. Um, I've struggled. I can't count the number of times and the amount of money I've spent on temperate penguiculas. <laughs> and I'll show you here. This is my last greatest attempt at right there a vulgaris <laughs> <laughs> that's and i must have tried 10 times with that um wonder there's a wonderful can, wonder if you can stick it outside well i know and that's i'm afraid to do that but i'm pro probably going to have to do it because it it wants it um there's a wonderful gentleman in florida that has some warm temperate um, penguiculas. Um, and I've tried and tried and tried. And for the most part, I think I agree with what I found in the mid-Atlantic. We're either too warm for the cold temperate mm -hmm. and we're too cold for the warm, for the, let's see if I get it backwards here. The ones that are in Florida, we're not, we're too cold in the winter. And for the vulgaris and the, any of the others, we're too warm in summer for them. So I've just really struggled with the temperate pings, which I've been really wanting to try to get my hands around doing some vulgaris. And um, they're really just really, they're beautiful. So I, I saw some wild vulgaris in Iceland. So I think they can handle your winter. Well, the vulgaris, well, why? Well, can hope so um yeah so it just the temperate pings i have not done very well with um yes i David, had you have another question for your mexican pings that look really good sure um so we saw some that were on rocks but for the ones that are in soil what is your uh, substrate recipe well for instance, well, the ones in the pots and particularly in this ter terrarium, in the back, there are some volcanic rocks, but they're completely overgrown with moss. The soil I use for the Mexican pings is generally, I mean, California carnivores has a ping mix. A couple people have some ping mix. I, I usually use maybe one part peat and two parts sand and or perlite it's basically a, your standard carnivorous peat mix but 
heavy on the sand and perlite is usually what I use. Um, and I say heavy on the sand and perlite, it's, that's what they want. Um, uh, so that's kind of the sub substrate that I use. Sometimes in these pots, I've kind of gotten to the point um, of topping some of them with gravel or sand. Again, being careful not to use the incorrect kind of sand. And that's been helpful in keeping some of the, you know, mold and uh, stuff, you know, undesirable stuff. So for the ones that are in a container that are a little lower in the container, do you need to have fans on for when you feed them not to get mold or fungus or do you have enough circulation? I have some pretty good circulation in this room here in the winter is the hardest. Again, in the mid Atlantic, it's just so dry. Um, I have a ceiling fan on. I have a, uh, a ductless mini split in this room, and I have a humidifier on. So as long as I keep it towards 40 or 50% humidity or greater, and with the ceiling fan on, um, it they seem to be fine. Um, I don't usually have, I haven't had much of any rot in here per se. And uh, David, Steve would like to know what is your light duration and do you change the light depending on the season? My light duration is, uh, let's see, they usually come on during the week at eight in the morning and go off around 930. Sometimes in the winter, I may back it off an hour or two. Um, that's the duration. What was the other question? Yeah, if you changed it for winter or summer. Yeah. Um, I, I, I sometimes will knock it back again. Sometimes I don't. The weekends I may drop it back just because this is our sunroom and this is where we like to spend our weekends. So we don't necessarily like have all this late at seven or eight o'clock in the morning when we're drinking coffee. So, yeah. Do you, um, for all of the Saracenia that you showed us, will they eventually live outside? Oh yes, oh yes. These are seed these are seed seeds that I started. I believe I had five or six varieties. The majority of them, I think, were actually from Canivers Plant Nursery, and I had some from some others. And um, yeah, they will go outside. This, see, this was their first. I started them last year. This will be their next winter inside, and then next year they'll. I'm hoping to get them outside. I had some other leucophilus that I started a few years ago, and this is going to be their first winter outside. All right, very cool. All right, uh, David, we're going to let uh, Keegan share his stuff, but then we'll, we're going to get you back on near the end. Sure. All right, thank you for showing, and I love... So, you know, we've been doing these webinars for many, maybe maybe two years. And a lot of times nurseries are the ones who are showing us behind the scenes. But it's more fun when the grower shows what they're what they're actually growing and their setups and all of that. So thank you. All right. Hello. You're very welcome. Hello, Keegan. Hi. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. Great. I'm gonna switch my camera around. We're gonna start with my um let's see, how do I do that? Oh, there it is. I'm going to start with my Highland uh, tank that I built here. Um, built this, I guess, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. So it's been up and running for a while now. It's an entirely custom build. Um, it's five feet wide, three feet deep by four feet tall. Um, wow. On the bottom here, there's actually a, uh, a tray that holds about four inches of water. So gives me good humidity. I've got this egg crate in here that all the plants are resting on. So beneath that is a, uh, is a water basin. Um, within the water basin, I actually have a fogger that sends up some, uh, some mist to uh, improve my humidity. Um, within this, uh, within this tank, I also have a, uh, like a reptile heat bulb here. 
Um, I run that in the coldest parts of the winter during the day to get my temperatures up. Got a fan here that runs 24 seven. Um, and then you can see in the back here, this is an air conditioner port. I actually have an air conditioner back here that uh, cools the um, cools the whole tank down at night. Um, that's set on a timer and runs uh, about five or six times for a period of about 10 to 15 minutes. And that gets me the cool temperatures that I need for this tank. Uh, it cools it down to about 50, 52 degrees uh, while it's running. During the day, just with the, uh, the lights, um, and uh, no other heat sources. It typically gives me 15 to 20 degree degrees of uh, Fahrenheit of um, of heat rise of, or of uh, heating. Uh, but I do run the heat bulb when I need to to get a little extra heat during the winter. During the summer, it can be challenging. We're in my basement right now, so it is it's not uh, it is insulated by the ground but it still gets up to 80 degrees or so down here in the summer sometimes. So sometimes I'll actually shut the lights down during the day if, if it's getting real hot or I'll run that air conditioner uh, during the day to help cool it down. Um, most of the plants in here have been pretty tolerant of that. Uh, some of the orchids, some of the Highland orchids that I have in here, Mazzavellias, Draculas, they can get a little stressed out during the day. Um, but uh, that's, that's another talk on the orchids here. As far as the carnivores that I have in here, I've got a lot of Nepenthes. I've got uh, a few Drosera, uh, a Utricularia, uh, Heliamphora. You can actually see a bloom spike coming up on this Heliamphora. I believe this is a either a minor or a minor hybrid. I can't remember off the top of my head here. And let's see, I think that's a, that's about it for the carnivores. Um, when I designed this tank, I had really uh, not taken into account how fast uh, things were going to grow. Um, you see one of the Nepenthes here is, is all but climbing out of the tank. Um, I like to chop the vine, but it's making such beautiful upper pictures. I actually just cut a flower stalk on it, um, but it's... It's really, uh, it's really taken well to the, my conditions here. Uh, really, at pretty much everything has. A lot of nice big pitchers. Um, I've got just layer after layer of plants in here. It's, uh, it's really been cool to watch it develop. This is really nice little uh, Velosa by Vici um, from Borneo Exotics. This is kind of cool. Not a carnivore, but a, uh, a little Dracula, Dracula Nectarina orchid. You can see the little monkey face on there. Um, but I'll try to stick to the carnivores here. I'll go around the tank. I've got some sundews hanging in a, uh, in a clay pot in there. I don't know if you can see that. More Nepenthes as you work your way around the back. Obviously, orchids and all kinds of stuff in there, tillandsias. Um, oh, you know what? I do have a little ping down in there. Not not blooming as nicely as uh, yours are, though, David. Uh, let's see. I've got a big piece of driftwood in here, and I spent uh, an, an, a lot of time mounting this driftwood in here. I actually have it suspended on these cables here. So it actually is hanging. You can see it wiggling a little bit. You'd never know because I filled up the tank with plants so much that you can't see that it's actually elevated up off the, uh, the surface of the ground, um, which I thought was really cool when I built it. And then I filled it up and you can't really see. Uh, but a lot of air plants on there. Um, let's see. Got a few really nice uh, new pictures on some of these Nepenthes. This is Truncata by Edwardsiana from Predatory Plants. This picture just popped and it is really, really looking spectacular. Uh, let's see. For anyone that's growing carnivores in a highland or close to highland environment, 
I've got to recommend Dendrobium Cuthbersonii hybrids. All these little brightly colored pinks and oranges that I have in here are uh, are Drosera, or I'm sorry, Dendrobium Cuthbertsonii hybrids, and they don't take up much space. The flowers last six to nine months plus, uh, and they love these conditions. I just have popped them in here, and they love growing with the uh, the carnivores. Um, let's see if there's anything else interesting in here. So I, I will say uh, that I recently found a baby praying mantis in my basement. So this has become uh, just in the last two days, a home from a little for a little tiny praying mantis. I don't know if you can see him hanging out up top there. I hadn't initially meant this to be a home for anything living. So it took a little uh, a little rigging to make it uh, praying mantis proof, but uh, he's still in here. So we'll see how that goes. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing I can point out is the misting system. It's a mist king misting system. I've got four uh, emitters there, a couple on the back wall over there. They do a fantastic job. They run about 10 times a day, do a fantastic job of keeping the humidity uh, in here nice and also giving a little, little mist to a lot of these plants. The uh, Tillandsias love it. I mean, everything loves it in here. The orchids, the panthes, pretty much everything loves it. Um, I'm using the uh, Carnivoro uh, Flora Wave lights. They're great, even in a very high humidity environment. They've, I've have a few sets of them. There's two different ones in here. Uh, I use them out in for my other plants. I'll, I'll show you my, uh, my other grow setup here in the basement. Next, they're great lights. Uh, the plants love them. I get get great colors. Um, can't recommend them highly enough. Keegan, uh, let's before yeah. you before you leave this area, can you tell us a little bit more about how you designed and built this structure? Yes, yes. So uh, I started with a uh, with the idea of you know creating a highland chamber. Um, something that I could really control the environment in. And uh, I will say that one thing that I did not take into account fully enough is accessing all, all uh, parts of the tank. Like it's big, but it's, it's almost too big for me to reach over to the back wall and water things or maintenance plants or just check on things. Um, but I digress. Uh, so I started off basically with a flat, I built a flat table and then I, I built up walls on it and lined it with a, uh, with a, uh, like a rubber basically, uh, to create my tray for water. Um, I had, uh, glass panes custom cut, uh, for the sides here. The, the, uh, they're joined with, uh, the, this nice, uh, angle, uh, pieces of aluminum and then flat aluminum in the back. Uh, and then just a wood frame top here. It's pretty simple. Just a frame with uh, wood on the outside. I've got some plexiglass on the top over here just to kind of keep the humidity in. in. Um, I do, when there's not a praying mantis living in here, I do open those, especially during the summer to dump heat or to allow better airflow. Uh, I actually have, I don't know if you can see, I've got a track where these two front pieces of, uh, of glass are mounted, um, aluminum, uh, track with runners that allows me to open and close these doors really easily. That was a little difficult to put together and, and make it all work correctly, but it's been absolutely worth it. The doors function fantastically. Uh, and they look really nice too. It's a nice clean look. Um, let's see. I actually have, I actually have, uh, tough to see, but I actually have down here on the legs, a couple of casters. So when, when I need to move this thing, uh, I just push the casters down and it literally rolls on the floor, which is pretty nice. And are we in a basement? Yes, we're in my basement. And uh, 
so the basement kind of keeps the temperature pretty good for those highlanders well so the the um air conditioner cools it at night and uh during the day you know all but basically july and august uh the basement temperatures are fine um being a fairly enclosed system the lights do heat it up again but it gives me that 15 to 20 degree temperature rise during the day that a lot of these plants want David says he's envious of your Nepenthes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Very good. Now, what about this little uh, terrarium next to this larger? Yeah. So this is a little Wardian case. Um, I've got a couple of uh, Peperomias in there. Uh, the only carnivore in there right now is a Drosera adelaide. Uh, and this has been basically untouched for the last five years. Um, I water it once every month or two, uh, but because it does leak a little air, which is fine, a little airflow is fine there, uh, but these guys just love it in there. I've had this thing in, in this spot where it's getting ambient light from the terrarium. I've had it in other areas of the house. Uh, it's, been, it's been really self-sufficient. Um, and if you are, uh, if anyone out there is a fan of the Philadelphia Flower Show, you've probably seen this in the past few Philadelphia Flower Shows. It's, uh, and I'll be taking it back again this year. Uh, generally does pretty well. For the larger enclosure, are you fertilizing the orchids and the nepenthes? Yes. So I use a Max C. Uh, a diluted maxi foliar spray and I just hit everything with that I will spray that directly into the pitchers I'll also use full strength uh, maxi right into the pitchers and I will use I've used I've used osmocote heard some not so great things about osmocote so I've switched over to uh, a Nutricoat 1311 11 uh, and I've used that in the pots of, of the orchids. I've recently read that you can actually use that in the pots of the Nepenthes. I haven't tried that yet, but I'll throw that in the pitchers. They all respond really well to that. Um, and uh, the orchids all would prefer probably if I fertilized them a little bit more. But uh, all the Nepenthes have, uh, have done quite well with the just basically a little foliar fur and uh, then some pitcher feeding. Well, everything looks beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll take you guys over here. Now I have a, um, an, another enclosure. This was actually basically the first enclosure I built. Um, this is more of an intermediate uh, situation. I grow Saracenia from seed. You can see a bunch of seedling Saracenia up here infiltrated by tons of Drosera. Uh, I've got, I've actually got some seedling uh, Nepenthes in here, um, back in here, a few different varieties. Um, I actually, there's one little one here. I was able to pollinate a couple of uh, my Nepenthes and produce seed. And these are the seedlings of that seed. The seed never left this little closet and I put it in this pot and a year and a half later, this little plant was produced right here in my basement, which uh, I'm pretty thrilled with. Um, Kenny, you'll like this one. I've got a nice, nice big bag by Cal in here. This thing is gorgeous, if not a little temperamental. It'll make a uh, slightly smaller pitchers in the winter because it does get a little cooler in here. Another nice picture over here. Love those fangs. Love those fangs. What is your um, substrate for the Nepenthes bicale carada? So I have it in in straight uh, long fiber sphagnum. Um, I try to keep it. I understand they're from a swampier environment. I try to keep it pretty moist all the time. Looks good. David says fangs. <laughs> yeah oh i love the fangs they are they are fantastic it's definitely a slow growing plant but once it picks up speed it it'll do okay but not one of the faster nepenthes for me um are, 
Um, I want to do a presentation on why Nepenthes by Kelkarat is the best Nepenthes at one of our conferences, but I was told I'm not allowed to. Huh. Um, let's see. We've got lots and lots of Nepenthes in here. Some nice Briggsiana. I think this is Peter D'Amato. Um, this plant was uh, was at the flower show last year as well. This thing just holds so many pictures. And you can see I, I have left some of the older pictures, but the bottoms are still um, alive. So I'm figuring they're still taking in nutrients. Um, and, you know, I, I still like the look of the pictures, even as they start to senesce as well. Um, let's see here. Lots and lots and lots of pictures in here. This is, I think, Song of Melancholy by one of the uh, EP hybrids. Really nice flare on that. Nice dark red color. Um, let's see. There's a lot, a lot in here. Some more Saracenia seedlings over there. Nice Vici back here. See that? Oh, there you go. What were all of those very long, skinny Nepenthes? And David has the exact this same is question. album Arginata. Yeah, yeah. So album Arginata. This plant has been funny for me. It it acts like it wants to die, and then it'll send out a bunch of pictures, and then it'll act like it wants to die again. These are definitely in senescence, but still pretty neat looking. Um, it didn't even it didn't produce pictures for like a year for me, and now and recently these are about six months old. It started picturing again, and these uh, more elongated. I I'm gonna say these are uppers because it's about four foot up the vine here, the pots all the way down on the bottom. These have just been so elegant and beautiful uh, with that nice elongated shape. Have you it's actually climbed all the way up into this this orchid over here? What's that? The last time you repotted it, um, do you remember what the roots look like? I I should re I should repot it. I don't think I have repotted it since I got it about five years ago. Um, why do you have a recommendation? Not really, but every time I've repotted albo marginatas, I noticed that they have just very fine, uh, like auxiliary roots, and just like very fragile. Okay. Compared to that's, some, that's good to know. It's definitely due for a repot. Do you have a mister for this enclosure? Yes. So this is actually on the same Mist King uh, system. You can see some of the nozzles right over here. Uh, same Mist King system that uh, that the other tank runs on, and I've got it. I've got it hooked up so they that it. I just have one uh, Mist King system for it. So when it runs, it runs in here and the tank, and my balance has been good. It. it I'm not. To giving anything too much honestly this could probably do a little bit more but i supplement with uh, a hand mister and watering rick would like to know if you have any tips for a queen anthurium even though this is a carnivorous plant only webinar i will allow it huh you know so you you must have seen my my anthurium hybrid down here it's doing very well, but don't let that fool you. I've killed a few of them. Uh, I, I don't know what the secret is. Um, I don't know what the secret is. I, I understand fertilizer. I use Nutricoat uh, pellets in mine. They seem to respond well. I also hit it with Max-C, uh, both dilute, and I've tried some of the, the normal strength in there and haven't killed that one yet. What is the temperature range and light for this enclosure yes so more of the uh carnivoro i think it's flora wave lights over here i've got some cheapies from amazon uh more of those cheapies in there you know and 
they definitely don't have the same quality of light, but they're still they're still getting getting the plants by here. Um, definitely the floor waves give the uh, get the best colors out of uh, Nepenthes and and Saracenia. So I try to focus those over the seedlings of the uh, Saracenia over here. And um, let's see, what was the other part of your question? Oh, temperature, temperature. So this is I call it intermediate. So that's a pretty broad range in the winter. The coldest it'll get is maybe 55, 60 at night. Um, let's see right now, right now it's reading about 72, 74. The lights have been on all day. Um, so, you know, you're looking at mid seventies during the day, during the summer, this gets quite hot. Uh, I will routinely shut the lights down during the day because this this will get up. I use sensor push um, sensor push um, thermometer and humidity sensors in here. So they go they alert me if the temperatures are going crazy. And uh, I've had this thing's gotten up to about 93 degrees before I'm able I was able to shut the lights down several times, which is very stressful for the plants, but uh, they managed to pull through. Um, I try to not let it get over about 85, 88. I mean, even that's a little hot for some of these plants. The Saracenia don't really mind, but some of the orchids and the Nepenthes uh, are not such a fan of that. Um, the whole, the whole uh, closet, as I call it here, is built with just a, a wood frame. And then I actually have an insulation material. Um, you can see this, this material here, it's, it's uh, foil on one side, backed with, um, I guess it's a foam product or or something in the middle. It's about a half an inch thick, so it does insulate the uh, the uh, temps during the winter, which gives me a little bit more heat. But it probably holds way more heat than I need during the summer, which uh, which has been a challenge. Um, you can see I've actually drilled some holes just to help dump heat. There's one here, one over there, some over here, and I'll actually keep uh, one of these panels out here um, just to kind of help dump heat and uh, give me give me a little bit more airflow. So this was uh, this was definitely quite a learning experience in in putting this together. Uh, I don't know that I would use this same material if I was building it again, but it was cheap and easy to work with, and you know this thing's been been together for three years or four years now so i'd, I'd say it's working all right as all right. far as the light uh frequency i actually run this mostly just to keep the uh the saracenia seedlings going so i do 18 hours on and six hours off uh which you know the orchids it screws them up as far as like when they flower uh but everything's still chugging along here and I still do get flowers on some of the orchids, um, but I never vary that. It's 18 on, six off, 20, 24 sevens, 365. All right, thank you, Keegan. That was a great collection. And uh, now we're also, you have a great Philly accent. <laughs> and uh, now we're gonna go to Kevin. Kevin Zhang, who's the founder and the current president of MACPS. And welcome, Kevin. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for inviting us to be here. Um, I don't know if I can beat either David or uh, Keegan's uh, setups, but I will uh, certainly show you guys what, uh, what I have. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about MACPS. Um, so we were founded in 2017. Uh, we have about uh, 300 members now. Um, we host four meetings a year uh, on average. And so generally our meetings run anywhere uh, from Virginia all the way up through New York, and then as far west as Western Pennsylvania and uh, Northern West Virginia. Um, our meetings generally last about a couple hours. We don't want you, if you're driving all the way, you know, four hours, we don't want you to come for a one hour event but we'll pack the day in very busy. We'll have speakers, we'll have auctions. Uh, we have uh, carnivorous plant trades and it's just generally just a fun time. Uh, all of our uh, meetings are free to the public. 
Um, so you are welcome to come. Um, and then you can also uh, bid on our plants, some of which go at some scary <laughs> low prices. Um, so you're welcome to join if you're anywhere in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, we also have some members from outside of that region. But uh, if you're coming from California or across the world, the International Carnivorous Plant Society is a fantastic resource. The newsletter that they publish is a true gem. And so there's always ways to be involved with the carnivorous plant community, no matter where you are in the world. Uh, and so with that, I will show you my setup. Uh, so I'm actually also in my basement. And I want to switch my camera around. So this is the greenhouse. Um, and one thing that you'll notice when I show you my Nepenthes is that I'm a big fan of uh, tubby pitchers. So Ampullaria, um, Mirabilis globosa, um, Rafflesiana hybrid. So there are a lot of those to the point where, for the most part, I look at a plant, I look at a pitcher, and I actually don't know what I'm looking at. I just go, that looks nice. And then uh, I have to dig way back to look at the, uh, the tag. But you'll notice that a lot of the plants that I have here are basically uh, Ampullaria and Ampullaria hybrids. So... I'll just kind of start on each of these shelves. I guess back here, uh, you can see I also have an Alba Marginata, although not nearly as nice as Keegan's, but you can see the nice uh, rim over there. Uh, this is a plant I newly, I recently got. Uh, it gets, it's the plant itself is actually all the way back here, but there's some nice pictures uh, down here. Uh, I think this is an Abdelaria Black uh, Miracle Hybrid with something else. Uh, you can have, see I have some more stuff down here. Um, that's an Ampullaria. I have a variegated uh, Gracilis um, with some small pitchers on it. And then down here, I actually have a uh, Nepenthes coccinia, uh, which was actually the very first Nepenthes I ever had. Although that clone is not this clone because I don't remember uh, the pitchers uh, from that original plant that I had being this pale. Um, anybody has a Nepenthes uh, coccinia plant, I'm always looking for uh, new clones of this plant, just because I have a, uh, you know, I have nostalgia for that. There is something going on back here. I don't know if you can see what that is. I'll try to dig out a picture. There's a, uh, well, there's one over here, actually. That's a nice one, Ampullaria hybrid of some sort. I like the peristome, variegated. That's a nice one back there. You can see I have an Nepenthes Gaia pitcher back here. I think space is always an issue. Uh, so I'm trying to cram a ton of plants into this tiny little space, which wasn't that tiny when I got it, but certainly has become tiny now. Back here, you can see I got a couple more uh, oddities. Kind of slowly pan the camera. Some more plants down here. This is a plant I really like. Again, you can see tubby little pitchers down in there. Lots more plants down here. This is a hybrid I got. Um, it was labeled as just a lowland hybrid. Don't know exactly what this is. Probably has some Mirabilis in it, but it's been growing very nicely. The plant is rather tall with a pot all the way down here and the plant itself is growing somewhere up there. Over here, I actually have a the same variegated gracilis. So you can see the leaves are actually all the way up here. There is some nice variegation. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, some more on this leaf. The plant is growing out of control. It's uh, over eight feet tall now, this vine. Um, I've already made a bunch of different cuttings, but I'll probably have to cut this one uh, again shortly. Here I have some of my smaller plants on this uh, higher shelf. I recently acquired a Campanulata that I'm uh, rather excited about. And then over here, uh, this is actually uh, St. Pacificus. Uh, I'll see if I can turn that picture around for you or at least pick up the pot. Let's see. Wow. Ah! Dumping out some of the liquid. This is a plant that I actually got from Sam Estes at Leilani Nurseries uh, before um, they uh, were damaged by the volcano. So it's a rather precious plant um, just because you can't get it anymore. But I really like it. It grows rather fast and the pictures are beautiful. Down here, some more Ampullaria hybrids. This is another very nice picture. Let's see what this one is. It is. Viking crossed with Ampullaria Black Miracle number four. That's a very nice plant. 
I think this one, nice ampullaria hybrid as well. I really like it. Lots of tiny little egg-shaped pitchers. Kevin, that, more. that, that previous yeah. uh, plant, did you get it directly from D. Flora? Uh, yes, it was shipped to me from Italy. Cool. This is a nice one. I love the um, the speckles on it. I don't know if you can see that. Going down here, this is one of my favorite plants. Uh, this is an Ampullaria cross with, with Rafflesiana. Makes these rather big uh, tubby pitchers. Here's a really nice example of one, if I can dig it out. It's actually really big. You can see my, it's like bigger than my hand, but even, you know, I think it's really rare to have a pitcher that's this form, yet also gets uh, rather big. And it's been very, very prolific. You can see all the pitchers are rather big. The plant has grown really well for me. Over here, this is another really beautiful plant that I recently acquired. Uh, I think this is cro something crossed with uh, Nepenthes uh, Vici Barrio. Let's see the tag. It is Mirabilis Red crossed with uh, Vici Barrio. And the peristomes are just truly stunning. I mean, look at that. I really like this plant a lot. And I think I have a smaller version of this as well. And then all the way back here, I know it's hard to appreciate, but I actually have um, a Lady Luck, one of the more common hybrids, but this has grown out of control. Uh, the plant is enormous and I'm not gonna dig it out for you, but last I checked there were something like 30 pitchers on this one plant. Got some air plants down here and some, uh, a couple of Drosera uh, down here. All the way back here is another good example of an Ampullaria that I have. Lots of those pitchers clustered on the bottom. And then over here, I actually also have a couple of uh, Bicalcarata, although Keegan has a great one. I love the fangs. I like the plant a lot. Um, I just think that it uh, the, the leaves grow enormous and the pitchers are still <laughs> relatively small, but I do like this plant a lot. And some more big plants in the back. I think this one over here is actually an Ampullaria cross with a Vicii. So it's got a relatively longer uh, pitcher shape but still has some, uh, still has that relatively tubby shape as well as um, some beautiful coloration. Over here, I just have some cuttings that I recently took, some more plants. And then I actually also have a leopard tortoise in here. It's a young tortoise that is uh, in the greenhouse because it needs some higher humidity. And then over here, I actually have one of my oldest Ampullaria. You can see that the, the tip of the vine is over here and it had a ton of ground pitchers. A lot of these have um, died off over time, but still you can see just the enormous quantity of pitchers that it has produced. And I think I've had this plant for upwards of 10 years now at this point. That's one of my favorite plants. All right, Kevin, we have to talk about substrate and fertilizing for that Ampullaria and all of your plants. Yeah, absolutely. So I keep it simple. Um, the substrate is actually a mixture of long fibered sphagnum moss and perlite. And I do that for basically every single Nepenthes I have. The bottom of the pots, uh, I have cocoa bark uh, or orchid bark rather, just uh, for a little bit more drainage. Um, but I've grown Nepenthes in everything from just pure long fibered sphagnum to the current mix that I have. Uh, in terms of fertilizing, uh, I do something similar to what Keegan does. So I also use a uh, maxi foliar spray, uh, quarter dilution. Um, but unlike uh, him, I actually also do a, uh, I also use maxi inside the pitchers, but I actually use a super concentrated version. Uh, and I find that if you put a little bit of it, it actually doesn't hurt the pitchers too much. So I definitely, I go heavier on the fertilization scheme uh, than I think most people do. Are you putting like the pure powder of the maxi in the pitchers? No, no. So I still mix it up into a liquid and then I use a little, uh, I guess, a, like a drip bottle or something like like a bottle with a, mm -hmm. I don't even know what you call it, like a little, a little spigot on it. Bottle. Yeah. <laughs> a squirt bottle. Exactly. There you go. Um, and it's uh, it's so concentrated to the point that the, it, the crystals will settle on the bottom, but it's still a liquid that's going in. So it's as concentrated as you can get it. Do you know if it's like a tablespoon per gallon or five tablespoons per gallon or? Uh, no, I just dump it in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you, when you mix it up, are you making like a cup at a time or a gallon at a time? 
usually about half a gallon at a time. All right. Yeah. And, and then I will just, yeah. Um, how wet, are, it seems to me that a lot of the substrate is kind of drier. Is that true? Yes. So that is true. Um, just because in the past, I've tried growing the pentheus on the tray method, uh, which actually has worked for a little bit. But then I find the roots, you really cut back on the root development. And then, you know, I so now you notice that all the nepenthes are in trays just to catch drips, but I don't want the roots sitting in water. And I actually prefer to keep them a little bit on the drier side because I think that actually helps root development. Um, and they've really done fine. That's yeah, a good I observation. Think, yeah. yeah, I think like soaking them and then letting them dry up really well makes their little roots stretch. And then the top part of the plant gets bigger. I agree. I agree. And then I'm just going to really quickly show you my Highland setup, which is nowhere near as nice as Keegan's. Um, but I grow it in, I grow my Highland plants in a um, uh, chest freezer. So it's relatively small. I'm always looking to expand, but uh, you know, this is kind of what I have for now. Um, if you can take a look, I'll actually pull this back a little bit. So on the top, I actually have this um, insulated glass. Unfortunately, broke one of the panes, but you can take a look in there. So I have some helium flora, and then I have uh, a small uh, baby Raja, baby Loei. And then I actually got from one of our members, Rick, who's on the call, an undulata folia, which I don't know if you can see there, is kind of in the middle of my screen there. The pictures are all the way at the bottom, but it's been growing really nicely for me. Uh, you can take a look over there. And then my wife has a couple of, uh, sorry about my finger, some restrepia orchids in there. Also have a Drosera uh, regia in there too. So yeah, that's me. Awesome, very good. Rick says, looking really nice, Kevin. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if Keegan, I think he had a Utrecht he had terrestrial utricularia. I was wondering if any of his flowered. Kevin, did you have, did you just show oh, us a terrestrial? Did I, yeah, so um, let me flip my screen again. Yes, I don't know if you can still see it. There is a, um, there, you can see one of the utricularia there. I don't know if, I forget if that's uh, reniformis or there's alpina in there, but the, the one with the kidney shaped leaves is not that. I'm just like, my mind is blanking right now on what it is. Well, rhinoformis um, means kidney. Yeah, I think that's the one it is, um, but that's in there. Have you ever gotten it to flower? No, I have not. I've gotten alpina to uh, flower. I've gotten longifolia to flower, uh, but this one is kind of just sitting there and uh, <laughs> biding its time. All right, very good. Keegan t tells me he does not have terrestrial utricularia. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for the MACPS for Kevin getting two members and you to share your collection. It was great. Um, I'm I'm happy that I saw that Deflora tag because, um, yeah, they started exporting to lots of different countries. And at our May conference, they will be one of the vendors for the conference, along with some people that you may have heard of. Andreas Wistuba, Carney Garden, also from Germany. Francois May from France. Green Jaws from Germany. Steven Eipenberger from Germany. And Thomas Caro from Germany. So we got a we got a really good lineup. I think a lot of people are familiar with those nurseries and um, artists. So we're excited for that. And uh, thank you once again, Kevin, and all of your members. And uh, do you have any closing words, David, Keegan, or Kevin? And Jeremy says, beautiful grow spaces, everyone. And I completely agree. I just wanted to, to thank Kevin uh, for getting us involved here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, Keegan, can you say in, uh, very briefly why it's a benefit to be join any carnivorous plant society like what did you learn or what's different than just going online and learning about carnivorous plants the personal connection um you know to to be able to go to meetings talk to people face to face about uh about these amazing plants 
Um, and Kevin and the, uh, the executive team have done a really good job of putting together interesting meetings, interesting uh, field trips. I haven't been able to go to the last couple, but uh, it looks like the group's had a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to put this kind of stuff together. And, uh, you know, we're very fortunate. I'm very fortunate to be so close to the, to the area here um, that we have the opportunity to do this. I just wanted to say thanks, uh, Keegan. I mean, it's a pleasure to see your plans. David, pleasure to see your plans as well. Um, I, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to help uh, put together programming for all the people in this area. I mean, I feel like every time I talk with people, I am really stunned by just the beauty of their setups and how much work and dedication has gone into all of this. Uh, and so whatever I can do to help grow this hobby, you know, I am all for it. And I'm so glad, uh, thank you, Kenny also, you know, for inviting us to be here and to share a little bit about our society and to show some of our members setups. All right, before we go, David wants to come back. <laughs> But okay, here there, we go. there, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> just to, to, again another thank you to the ICPS and and Kevin for for uh, putting this on and gathering us here. Uh, the Mid Atlantic Group, we do uh, our field trips. We had some good ones last year. We're looking forward to having some more. I, I think we've a couple of our members have dropped some hints of, of maybe exploring some different areas over in. Um, New Jersey and the Pine Barrens. We had a good trip upstate in Pennsylvania and um, looking forward to getting down into, into Virginia and uh, seeing what's going on down there. So just stay tuned and uh, looking forward to it. It's not a surprise that gardeners, educators, and scientists are fascinated by these unique plants. The International Carnivorous Plant Society or ICPS not only love these plants, but welcomes growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. The ICPS even started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate them. The free online event is held the first Wednesday of May. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.